Hey, if you tuned in last week, you saw uh, how excited I was to put this whole thing together. You know the drill, now it's got to come apart. This week on Ryan Flies. But don't worry, I'm still excited. Why? Uh, it's going to allow us to do something I've yet to do on this channel, and that is take a deep dive into priming. By far, the most common questions on this channel are related to the priming process. So we're going to slow down a bit uh, when it comes to that, and I'm going to detail kind of what I've learned to date, what I'm using, uh, and how it's applied. But first, this whole thing has to come apart. Off camera this time around, I did all the mass drilling, and that was pretty uneventful, but something else I did was spend a couple hours staring at this thing, um, taking pictures and making notes of what needed to be adjusted. Now, if you remember back to last episode, I noted that there was going to need to be some adjustments to get proper fit, especially in the aft section of the aft fuselage near the tail. Um, so again, I documented what I thought needed to be worked on the next time I have this apart so that hopefully when this goes back together with everything primed, it fits real nice and we can get straight to riveting. Now, there's a bit too many rivets for me to blue tape everything that I'm going to leave undimpled, undrilled, untouched. Uh, I don't want to go through five rolls of tape, but there's one in particular I could see myself forgetting, and that's the rudder stop right here, which will not get a dimple or a rivet just yet. The remainder of the aft fuselage structure kept reminding me of like a whale carcass that had been slowly picked on uh, as it was decaying on the bottom of the ocean floor. It was sort of a sad sight and I was really excited to get the priming behind me so we could start to get this thing back together. Okay, so with the tedious deburring out of the way, um, I have some prep work for my prep work. And what that means is, basically I have some steps to take before I can prep to prime. Uh, and the majority of that is related to parts that overlap. Most of our skins are gonna get primed on the inside. In fact, all of them will get primed on the inside. But there are portions where skins will overlap and moisture can accumulate in those areas. We wanna make sure there's primer there. And there's other areas where the outside of the skin becomes the inside. And this would be true where the bottom skin has sort of a J channel formed into that skin and that folds onto the inside of the plane. We wanna make sure that gets primer too. So what I'm doing is taping off these areas so that when we prep the inside of the skin, I can also prep the outside of the skin, um, but not into where it's gonna be visible from the outside. Makes sense? Probably not, but we're gonna stick with that. Uh, I'm gonna continue to tape these areas off uh, and then we'll talk about dimpling versus scrubbing. I got most of these areas taped off. Now, when I go to spray, I will cover the rest of this with some paper, but we want it open for now. Uh, what I'm really looking for is making sure that we have this border outlined uh, so I know where to clean and prep for prime um, versus where to leave shiny because I like my metal shiny. Now when it comes to prepping, typically I would dimple and then I would scrub my parts. What that does is it allows for less handling of the part after it's been scoured with the, the pre-coat and ready to get into the prime loop. However, when we're dealing with skins and other areas where there is a lot of dimpling, sometimes I reverse the order. The reason being Dimpling essentially turns these large areas uh, into a cheese grater and, it, and that cheese grater will chew the living heck out of your scotch bite pads uh, and it really slows down the prep process. So with skins and other large swaths that have a lot of rivets, uh, often I will do the pre-coat first 
uh, and then I'll go ahead and dimple and then we'll do a final clean with rubbing alcohol to remove any oils from my hands that I've re-imparted uh, from the dimpling process. So the long story short here, we're going to scrub before we dimple. So I'm going to get the pre-coat and we'll talk about that process a little bit. Let's get the really basic stuff out of the way first. What is priming? Now, most people are familiar with priming as a process before painting. Uh, that's not what we're doing here. We're not, we're not putting anything down in order to prep the surface for paint. In fact, none of the things that I'm priming right now will ever get painted. And that's just the point. There's nothing protecting them from the atmosphere and from moisture that will prevent corrosion. Aluminum has its own version of rust. It's oxidation and it will eat away at the aluminum and eventually it will cause structural damage to your airframe. Now, that doesn't always happen. In areas where it's really dry, a lot of people choose not to prime. In fact, even in areas where it's wet, a lot of people choose not to prime because aluminum by nature doesn't rust quite as easily as something like cast iron. Uh, I have, however, chosen to prime uh, because I live in a moist environment and I also believe that uh, it will do things like improve the resell should I ever decide to sell this plane. So we're not priming in anticipation of laying some paint down. We are priming to prevent the surface from being exposed to elements that may cause corrosion. Essentially, we're coating the surface as a protective layer. Now, like the other primer, or even paint for that matter, we have to prep the surface to prime. Uh, we have to remove oils, we have to remove grease, we have to scuff it or mar it to, to give the primer something to grip onto. Um, and my chosen method of doing that is something called pre-coat. So pre-coat is a method of preparing the aluminum surface for priming. There's numerous ones. Uh, you may see some build logs where people have baths of kind of an etching solution. Um, pre-coat, in my opinion, is, is sort of the user-friendly version of prepping your surface. It's probably not quite as effective as some of those uh, etching baths that you've seen. Um, and I knew this getting into it. Uh, Pre-coat is, is essentially, uh, I think, sort of an etching degreaser. Um, I don't know exactly what's in it. I do know a few things. A, you want to wear gloves because it will irritate your skin, but beyond that, it's not overly aggressive. There are no fumes and you don't need to wear a mask, which is nice. Um, B, it's not incredibly horrible for the environment and you're not using a ton, so there's no real worry about environmental impact. Now, with those etching baths, I've heard from some people that it can be hard to, to discard that waste that's left over and, and sort of a bear to deal with. I'm happy that we don't have to deal with anything like that. It's pretty easy to work with. We essentially spray it on and we scour with Scotch-Brite. That scouring helps with cleaning, but again, it helps with marring of the surface. Uh, typically, the pre-coat is sort of the first stage of prepping the surface to prime, then you have to remove your pre-coat. It's gonna turn black. And the reason is you're actually removing some aluminum from the surface and, and, and that scuffing process, you're taking a layer away with you. And so that needs to be not only wiped off, which can be quite messy, but then you've got to strip that kind of re residual layer off itself. Uh, you can do that with a number of things, anything from acetone to right now what I'm using with great success is 90% isopropyl alcohol. So with that little bit of explanation, I'm going to get to scrubbing. I've got a lot of surface area to do, so it's going to take some time. Once we do the scrubbing, uh, again, on these pieces, a bit backwards from normal, but I'm going to get in and do some dimpling in anticipation of a final cleanup and then priming. There's all that stuff. That's essentially aluminum that we have scrubbed off. And if you look here, our sheen is now gone and we've got uh, a surface that has some tooth that's gonna allow that primer to, to really take hold, hopefully preventing uh, any sort of chipping or flaking in the future. Now for this, the reason we have the tape is I have a skin coming in that's gonna just barely overlap right around here and I need to do the same thing. However, 
on this side of the tape, this will be exposed to the outside air. Uh, this is the exterior of the aircraft. I want to try and keep that as shiny as possible until this whole thing gets painted. All right, we can set this piece aside for now to move on to the next one. I won't bore you with the massive amount of scrubbing I have to do. I've got a couple hours ahead of me, I'm sure. But we'll pick this back up when we're ready for the next step, which is going to be dimpling all these parts. Okay, uh, before I got started dimpling, I wanted to take some time, a decent amount of time, to really study the rivet plans. I'm looking for things like universal head rivets that wouldn't require a dimple, holes that should be left blank, or anything else that is gonna trip me up as I go through dimpling these and later riveting these in. There are two items so far of note. One we've already talked about, and that's the rudder stop. The rudder stop does not need a dimple. Uh, plain and simple, leave that flush. The other is a small hole above the rudder cable egress that's going to need a dimple. In fact, it's going to need a big dimple. We need to widen that to a number 19 and then dimple for a number 8 screw. It says here to do this before we go riveting anything on. So it's important we take care of it with this step and the rest of this business. Otherwise, I don't see much that's going to trip us up. So I'm going to start dimpling. I thought doing a primer episode was important just based on how big of a topic it is and how many questions I get. There is a lot of talking through this, bear with me. Uh, I have been making some really great progress and I'll be back with episodes detailing that just after we're done finishing these parts. Now that we've got all of our pieces dimpled, uh, the, the last few items here are to scrub it back down with 90% isopropyl, which is what I'm using in this case. You could use acetone, you could use something else. Um, incredibly important here because I just have my grubby hands all over these things trying to fight them uh, through the various positions needed to get all of these pieces dimpled. Uh, once I have them cleaned down, I'll do the final masking, so things like covering that. And then we're gonna set up the booth to start spraying. Now, that's easier said than done because this time around, these pieces are substantially longer than my prior booth. Well, I'm getting the side skins uh, ready for the booth or trying to fit them in the booth and this is where we're at as it stands i was really hoping i could maneuver the skins uh and and have just a portion of it sticking out through a little hole that would help keep things better contained in the booth however i don't think i have the room to really maneuver them in like that so i think the only real option is to leave the door open and drape a cloth on the outside of it um, and sort of just create an extension out, out the front door of the booth. Again, I'll use the term, is not ideal, but for the limited amount of time that we're going to be messing with this, I think it's fine. I have two primers right now on this project, and, and it'll probably be that way through the finish line. Um, I have the original primer that I set out to use, which is an Axo Noble two-part epoxy aerospace primer. Uh, and then I have the primer that I've chosen to use on the interior of the aircraft, uh, which is from Eastwood. It's also a, a primer uh, intended for bare metal, two-part epoxy, uh, and a, a corrosion preventative. Um, first, to focus on the Axo Noble. I chose the Axo uh, based on some research, and there was a few things that stuck out to me. 
Uh, one is that it, it has a really high corrosion resistance against a huge number of fluids and, and it seemed like an incredibly durable product. Um, I also had watched a few videos and read uh, a few papers or articles um, that reported that it was incredibly easy to spray. I went into this project having extremely limited use which with an HVLP gun. Um, I've used it probably a handful of times um, and, and I think I was probably spraying uh, boards with some sort of, of latex or something similar. Um, having a product that was easy to apply was probably my number one criteria in going into this. Um, and it is, it is incredibly easy to apply. Uh, and, and even still, I think for the first six months, I struggled to get it right. Was yeah. that it dries extremely quick, um, like ready to touch in five minutes, ready to work with in an hour, um, type quick, uh, which if you watch my videos, you know, suits me well. Um, some downsides, it, it is pretty hazardous. It's, it's some pretty nasty stuff. And and I do my best to keep all the fumes outside um, and, and really sort of sanitize my garage and flush out the air in it as much as possible in between spraying sessions. Um, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, last time I checked, um, it's up to like four or $500 a gallon, or I guess that's two gallons, but uh, the price will make you pucker for sure. Um, but I think it's worth it. Uh, if you're spraying correctly, uh, one set will get you through an entire airplane. Um, one set is going to get me through an entire airplane and I wasted a bunch and we'll get into that in a second. That said, uh, I have struggled a little bit. Now I want to say that I, I am probably the last, uh, person that should be giving advice on spraying this primer. Keep that in mind. Um, however, I also think that I am uniquely qualified to give some advice because I've, I've really learned a lot of lessons on doing it. Uh, incorrectly for so long or so many times and figuring this out on my own um, you know one of the one of the more recent things I've done is add another regulator on the gun and that was probably one of the most helpful things I've done uh, it allows me to adjust the pressures up a little bit on the tank to keep good airflow and, and have that line not starve but then turn it down at the gun um, I, I think going into this originally i was always throwing too much paint on it and and then i would wind up with some splattering and so to mitigate the splattering i would up the air and so what i wound up with uh in most of my priming sessions i'd say um was a lot of paint being sucked out of the the booth and in you know into the tubes uh so essentially a lot of waste um still as i mentioned even with all that waste i think i've got plenty to, to finish this project out um, what I've learned is, is a lot lower pressure. Um, and I think when I, when I squeeze the trigger at the gun, I've, I've got just under 20 PSI. Um, and it, it goes on really well. Uh, with that lower pressure, I've dialed the paint way back and I thought I'd have trouble with coverage. And I was surprised to find I didn't again, because that paint isn't just blown all around the booth. You can thin the product and I tried for a while to thin the product because I thought that might help me. Um, and I used a, I used a MEK substitute, um, that the, the product says thin with MEK and then this, it's hard to find MEK these days. Um, this, this MEK substitute basically said use where you normally use with MEK and it thinned it well. I just don't think it was necessary. Uh, it's already pretty thin product. Um, and, uh, I think I was just trying to, to, I, it was the wrong avenue to try and solve some of the issues I was having. Um, the splattering wasn't due to the product being too thick. The, the splattering was due to the product uh, being applied too heavily. That said, um, all of my priming uh, has always come out pretty, pretty good looking. And I think that's a testament to the product. Um, despite improper gun settings, I've never had runs. I've never had drips. I've never had parts where I felt it was too heavy. Um, I've had parts where I felt like it was a little too light, but that's on me, uh, and not being thorough in, in my coverage. Um, so uh, again, uh, if, if you're at all worried about your ability to, um, to spray and, and your lack of experience there, this might be a, a good option for you. And that, 
it, it's, it is pretty easy, especially compared to that Eastwood, which we'll get into in a minute, it's pretty easy to lay down. Uh, the, the technique is pretty simple. Uh, it's mixed one-to-one -one based on volume. Uh, again, I don't think there's any need to, to thin that down. Mix very thoroughly, as with any two-part product. Uh, I've, I've heard always mix for two minutes. I'm probably a little shy of that, but I definitely give it a, a very good stir. I'm using the, the knockoff version of the 3M paint system. Uh, so basically cup liners um, and, and a little adapter for the gun that prevents you from having to clean up uh, your your cup afterwards and I would recommend that to anyone they're cheap and the ability just to throw away your your excess and, and not have to mess around with cleaning a cup is great so the paint system has a cup now I didn't fully trust based on where I got these cups that these measurements held true um, even with the liner in place uh, so this is your disposable liner I, I have tested it. I tested it by weight, uh, but I also realized that these two were different weights and, and that was part of me trying to figure out if I was using one more than the other. Um, but even that was related to my distrust of these cups. Um, I have put equal amounts of varying quantities in these cups uh, to measure it up against this part here. Uh, it is indeed accurate with the liner in place, so rest assured you can trust it. Um, and then this is the lid. Again, it's got this nice fine mesh here. Um, now you should still probably pour your green in through the mesh, though I don't always do that. Uh, some mesh cone filter. Um, I tend to just stir it really well and pour it in, knowing that this is my backup filter here. Um, as far as how much to mix, you're gonna have to get a feel for that. Uh, I've bounced between anywhere of 75 milliliters of each part if I have a small batch, and sometimes that's plenty. When doing wing skins, I was mixing, or ribs, uh, I had a ton of ribs to do. I was mixing as much as 200 milliliters of each part, um, and that'll get you some good coverage. It, it does suck running out uh, halfway through and having to mix up another batch and wait another 30 minutes. It also sucks to waste this stuff, because as I mentioned, it is not cheap. Um, so I, I'm sure you guys will figure it out just based on your own pocketbook and, and time savings uh, and doing it right. There's not much expertise I can help there. With skins as large as what we have going on today, I'm probably gonna be mixing about 300 milliliter, milliliters total, uh, 150 of each part. Actually, now that I look again, I'm, I'm gonna go probably for 400. Now I'm thinking that I poured way too much, we'll see. I immediately regret 400. I think I probably could have done it with 300. Um, once it's mixed, it has to kick for 30 minutes. And I mentioned, I think in my last video, be careful because that 30 minutes will give this stuff enough time to separate. Uh, when it sits, it separates. And so, uh, after it's done kicking, you want to stir it again or slosh it around, and I even try to do that as I'm painting. Um, its pot life is, is surprisingly long for how long or for how quickly it'll dry. Um, so I've, I've painted for upwards of an hour, uh, swapping parts in and out, um, and, and just keep it moving through the gun, I think, is, is the trick there. Uh, I usually have to let parts dry a few minutes, only a few minutes to the touch, and then you can start to flip it. I've used things uh, like the chicken wire uh, is helpful for not having too much contact, and then I've actually started using angled aluminum to help brace things up. Um, and you can usually, if it's a two-sided part, you can get both parts done in the same uh, primer batch. Um, and then usually within a couple minutes, you can bring them out and lay them down on some plastic. Careful, uh, don't lay them down on top of each other. The primer will adhere to itself because it is still uh, kicking and it'll, it'll act as a glue and they'll be stuck together. Um, luckily I haven't had that uh, problem affect me in, in a great way, but, but I have seen a few times where it has a propensity to stick to each other. Um, once everything's primed, cleanup is, I think, pretty simple. Cleanup was something that I was always concerned about when I uh, went into priming because I always thought it was messy, even from my airbrush days. 
Um, and it is messy, uh, but it's, it, again, it's pretty simple. You take the cup, you throw it away, uh, you flip your gun upside down. And then uh, from there, I disassemble the whole gun um, and I use some lacquer thinner or that same MEK um, and just go over every part. Now, it'll dry to your gun as quickly as it dries to your parts. And so you want to, as soon as you're finished, you want to get in there and get that gun clean. Um, it, it is a bear to get off once it's adhered to, to the gun. Uh, the primer, one half of it, the green half of it, does have solids. Stirring that incredibly well is important before you mix. And then you, you probably want to pour through a strainer. Uh, if you're using the same cup system that I have, that has a fine mesh strainer in it, which is nice. Um, but, but you'll even get crud inside your gun um, that needs to be flushed out. Um, and so I, I wash it pretty thoroughly, clean the needle, uh, clean the nozzles, clean everything. And then I usually leave it out until the next day when I get to work on the parts again and I'll, I'll reassemble everything and put it away. Um, I think that's about it. I'm a little concerned that I'm like unabashed just putting this on the internet when I know so little about it and inevitably somebody's going to tell me I'm doing it wrong. But that's great because uh, I, again, even though I'm figuring this out, I could definitely use some pointers. Could I done it with 300? Maybe. I would have been cutting it. 350 would have been perfect. I'm not too disappointed in 400. There's a little bit of waste, but it's not going to kill me. Okay, so the very front edge of these two skins uh, has a possibility of a little tiny strip being seen in the cockpit. And it would drive me nuts if that were green. It also gives me a great excuse to go over the white primer while we're doing this in-depth look at priming. When I set out to find a product uh, to use in the cockpit of the plane, I had some criteria. Uh, it had to be white, it had to be a two-part epoxy, and it was hopefully relatively easy to work with. Now, there was a number of products that fit that bill. I don't want to get too in the weeds on why I didn't go with some, some products that came with great recommendations. Some of it was as simple as availability. This product does require two coats from what I found. This product doesn't require a flash time like the AXO. We're simply going to mix uh, a one-to-one -one ratio of the primer, give it a good stir, and shoot it. From what I found is we get a nice, shiny, white, opaque finish after those two coats. Now, unlike the AXO, you're not going to be able to work with this like an hour afterwards. In fact, I've found it takes at least four to six hours and really uh, I haven't had any good success without waiting a full day. Now, there are some instances, and I'll probably do that with these, where we can get parts in position, but if you're going to be working with them, riveting them, it's going to take at least a day. I'm going to handle these a little bit differently than I normally ever would, but I have zero desire to fight them back into the paint booth because I'm going to do just a quick spray here. I'm going to mask up. I'm going to do it right on the table, uh, and I'm going to open the doors and let the place air out. I want to thank everyone for joining me on this in-depth look at priming. Hopefully it's answered some questions. Uh, for those of you missing the build part of this airplane build, don't worry. There's been a lot of action on that front too, and I will be back with some new videos continuing the construction of the fuselage. We'll see you soon. Thank you for watching Ryan Flies.